I, I have a question for whoever wants to answer it. And I don't, um, I hope you'll forgive my going back to the history. I just want to, uh, you know, we've been all been told kind of a story that isn't true. We've kind of appropriated, you know, in, in some sense, your stories. And so an important part of this interview is to let you tell your stories and you're all doing a beautiful job of that. I also want to re-educate people about maybe a, 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 a better story, uh, an authentic story. And I think it's it, an important part of that is understanding Joseph Smith. Uh, really quick, Angela, you said he was a grave robber. Now, many people who have been you know listening to Mormon stories and reading books know that he was involved in this treasure digging thing where he would um, convince people that he could see buried treasure under the ground. And then he would get people to dig and dig and dig, and they would never find treasure. Uh, but he was able to keep people believing that he had the power to see treasure, hidden buried treasure underground, even though no treasure was ever found. I don't think people have an understanding about Joseph Smith being a grave robber. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you meant by that? And then I have a, a follow-up question about Joseph Smith. Yeah, so um, he doesn't actually ever get to say how he acquires these objects or how he's thinking about these things that he describes later in the Book of Mormon, which are most likely because they come not because he has a tight relationship with the native people in the area, but because he finds them in the ground. And the best way that he finds them in the ground is most likely because he finds these areas where the graves are and they have the objects in them. A lot of um, folks who are uh, passed on, they, they're buried with their materials. And some well, of those what types of objects do you mean that he referred to? Um, so like, you know, when he's talking about like the Urim and Thummim or some of the uh, the stones that he's looking at where he's putting it in his hat and he's looking through it and, you know, seeing the translation come through in the dark of the hat uh, for the Book of Mormon. Um, you know, these are these are things that their materiality is based in reality, but his perception and interpretation of these things are of his own making. He's just influenced of the things that are around him in his environment. I don't think he spent as much time hanging around learning about cultural and spiritual traditions of native peoples as he did hanging around the churches of Palmyra, figuring out how can I make my narrative different? How can I make this enterprise successful by making it distinctive, interesting, a little bit sexy, because it's not exactly the same thing that you can produce over and over again out of one Bible. It's like, well, what if there's a Bible for the Americas? I think that was interesting enough for him. Um, I, but any of that that you question further in terms of the materiality, again, was, was of his own making beyond the story. So if you're thinking about the plates, they didn't exist. They weren't in, in the Hill Cumorah, even though Hill Cumorah was there. You could go there. I've been there. I've checked it out, even as an anthropologist, archaeologist um, major looking at things. You would see evidence of people there. You would see evidence of camps of hundreds of people, horses, um, things that were grown, places that would be used for gathering water or for sewage or for garbage in midden, for broken arrows, um, broken wheels, chariots, any of that stuff, a tusk from an elephant that shows up in the Book of Mormon, something. Just give me something that says that what his story is is actually true and accurate, and it's not. And I think, you know, for much of what he is collecting in terms of his idea of what indigenous peoples are does come from his environment. And you have to realize all the way up into that area from the Northeast down to the Southeast was mounds. They had mound cultures. And you could see still some of those evidence of mounds that still exist. Everything that from sheep of animals like birds or snakes, and those had a lot of burials in them. And they also had a lot of materials in them. They had things that came with those bodies take them into the spirit world, give them acknowledgement, honor them with those gifts, whatever it was that was, you know, affiliated with them. So it, it wasn't an accident. He didn't generate these things out of nowhere entirely. I, I was going to add, and of course there's a, I think Illinois even rec recognizes that the first archeological dig is, is a mound that Joseph Smith and I, I can't, Zion's, 
my Mormon history here is going to fail me here. Zion's March, is that what they Zion's <laughs> camp. And they excavate and they quote unquote excavate a, a mound and find Zelf, the, the white Lamanite. He has a, they, they dig up this mound and they see bones, they see human remains and, and he has a prophecy and he says, oh, this is, there's a great war here, you know, and this was a white Lamanite. He was a righteous Lamanite, you know, like his skin turned and he was a righteous Lamanite and his name's Zelf. Um, uh, and, and, uh, and all the dehumanizing activities that went around that as well, you know, and I, I, I agree with what Angelo was saying. And it's still alive and well today, actually. There was in, in Utah uh, in 2009, you know, like just in Bears Ears country, you know, like there was prosecutions. There were, there were well, mm-hmm. not prosecutions. They all ended up not being prosecuted, but there, there, were, there were arrests that were made uh, based upon uh, digging human remains and and funerary objects that that there's a culture in, in a lot of these Mormon areas um, around this, this these notions <laughs> of excavating not excavating but, but digging digging graves uh, all the problem that, that is thank you I, I'm guessing that none of you believe that Joseph Smith actually obtained golden plates or the sort of Laban or a Urimum thumum from uh, angel Native American. Is, is there anybody who believes that he actually did get those artifacts from an angel? Not well, anymore. <laughs> okay. So when, when, when you talk about grave robbing, it's just whenever he would be involved with coming upon these mounds and, and excavating or pulling whatever he found from them. And, and that would be something that would be deeply disrespectful um, and, and sacrilegious to, to a Native American. Is that right? Yeah. And um, to put a finer point on it, if they did exist, if the plates are real, if the Urim and Thummim exist, they're ours. Those are indigenous objects and they should be returned back to the people. <laughs> right. So technically, yeah. we should repatriate that. If you have it, Mormon Church, if it's in your vaults, in your walls, bring it back to us then. Because... He's, he's right, man. He's talking about blossoming as the rose, that one day that we will return the truth back to you. Okay, well, then you got to return the truth back to us. You have to tell us what it is that you think that you have, and then we'll tell you if you have it. Because the real truth is, you know, we already have our own cultural and spiritual traditions. And we're happy to share that again with you, because that is our truth. And in the end, I think respecting and acknowledging what our truths are will actually save them and it will be us that will save them in the end because that is those are the missing parts of their lives the holes in their hearts and their minds and their spirits where they come to us sick right now they're coming to our doorsteps and our need of communities and they feel like they have something missing and they they don't feel complete and they're depressed all the time and they have all these you know bad uh, thoughts and feelings. It's the culture, the culture that they grew up in, the the conditioning and the socialization of all these things that they feel like are acceptable, but it's not our way. That, not, that right yeah. there, um, <laughs> that right there, the coming to a sick. I I've often thought about Joseph Smith and how, mm. like where where the people that were coming over, you talked about how they were coming from trauma. Yes. Uh, And they were, it was traumatized people coming to, to America. And I've often thought about Joseph Smith. Am I angry at him? Am I not? Am I angry at him? Am I not? And so having read up on him and like, where did this story come from? Where did, where did he come up with these ideas? I see this kid that was raised in a family that wasn't well-respected that struggled financially um, that was religious, but had their own trauma they were dealing with. Um, and I also see that even in the Book of Mormon, you see Lamanites and Native Americans being romanticized as well as the conflicting side where it's, are, are we proud or are we ashamed? Are we proud or are we ashamed? Um, and I think in some ways, that's where he came to Native Americans also, is feeling that same type of hole in his heart or loss. And so there, it's hard to talk about Mormonism without talking about Native Americans when they are in Mormon history. You, you can't separate the two. Um, well, that, we can't, Sarah. 
Well, I just mean from a Mormon standpoint, <laughs> it's hard to separate from the Mormon standpoint, their history as it connects to us um, and how much it was pulled into being narrated for us and, and the things that he did. Um, but understanding that they came from a colonized people also, and it was traumatized people that brought, brought that trauma. Um, I often think about also the, you know, missionaries now. I have, I have major issues with missionaries now, young, young people that have in, in their own ways been colonized, regardless of skin color. And they're going out teaching things that they don't understand or know. You know, I, I was triggered a bit by some of the conversations I had with missionaries earlier this year. And I'm like, these kids don't even know, <laughs> you know, and there's just seeing that different side. I know Angela also talked about how as Native Americans or indigenous people that everything we look at, we look at the other side. We look at the, the different angles from it. Everything's circular, not straightforward. And I feel the same towards towards people of every race, every religion. You know, there's so many sides to everything when it comes to colonization too. Yeah, I would love those golden plates back, but uh, they, they, they back, went back to heaven though, right? <laughs> they're, they're in heaven, aren't they? <laughs> no, I mean, just just real quick. Um, I just wanted to say a thing or two about Joseph Smith. You know, but my my uh, history, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, reading of history about him, um, and and how you know he came up with the ideas. Uh, did, didn't he uh, kind of um, do a spinoff off the the book uh, by Ethan Smith, um, the, the View of the Hebrews? That that was my that was a little bit my my research. Sense. Where, the, where there were two groups of people who fought against each other. Uh, one, one was righteous, one was evil. So you got the Nephites, Lamanites type of rhetoric there. Um, it, it makes sense to me that, that that's where he probably was influenced, or at least one of his biggest influence was. I mean, I know it's a whole different um, chapter uh, to talk about that issue. But um, for me, that's, that's where, you know, America was at the time, is, is they had this kind of fascination with where did these Native American people come from? Um, and, and, you know, I, there was Christian, Christian preachers around that area that kind of, you know, were, you know, going off the idea that, well, maybe, you know, they're Hebrew descent, Hebrew descent, um, you know, make, we're really sure. So there was this book written in a view of the Hebrews that was kind of out there and, and somehow Joseph Smith got his hands on it, read it and said, Hey, this is kind of a good, you know, philosophy, good theory. And, and just kind of, kind of went off that, um, that, that, at least that's my understanding. Thank yeah, the history of, of Native Americans being romanticized and demonized. Yeah. And not just jo Joseph Smith. It was, yeah, before him and all around him at that time. And I'm just, and yeah, I think you're right, Sarah. I think there were, there were many people trying to come up with stories as to how, you know, where the Native Americans came from and why they were there. And, and the, the thing that I really wanted to tease out, if you think about the way that African Americans were treated, they were enslaved. And you think about when you when you take a group, a fellow group of humans that you're going to enslave and or, you know, kidnap and or enslave and or kill, you know, you have to be able to look each other in the eye and you have to kind of look your children in the eye. And you need some type of way to manage the cognitive dissonance of the fact that you're kidnapping, displacing and murdering fellow humans. And so, you know, when I've, when I've looked at the curse of Cain rhetoric around African Americans, and I've thought about that, it's like, well, of course, you're going to come up with a story that that explains why these people deserve to be kidnapped, displaced, killed and enslaved. And, and it's got to come from a very high source, because, you know, murder and enslavement is a pretty serious thing. And so you come up with a story about how they became dark and why they became dark and what their fate and what their destiny is as a result. And of course, it's got to be their own fault, right? It can't be something that isn't their fault. Um, and so you come up with stories about either their lack of valiance or their wickedness or their evil. And to me, that seems like a, a, a really uh, subconscious or conscious effort to manage your cognitive dissonance about how you're treating a big group of people. And so what is it, what is it about the, you know, 
the story of the Book of Mormon that might, you know, what purpose might it serve when you think about the way the Book of Mormon describes Native Americans as dark and loathsome, um, as filthy, as unclean, as wicked? Um, I, I just have to think there has to be some connection between that type of rhetoric that Joseph Smith ends up incorporating into the Book of Mormon and, you know, this sense of white American consciousness that's trying to grapple with the fact that they're displacing and and killing and enslaving an entire group of people. Does anybody is anybody able or willing to talk about that? Does that make sense? I'll take it. I'll take yeah. it. <laughs> I'll take it. Um, I, I you look at the history, and I, I what I understand some of my history, and I, I know there's better probably Mormon historians on here than me, but some of the very first outreach actually was Catarazagus Indians actually to be to convert them to Mormonism. Almost at the very beginning of the first missionary outreach was Cataraugus Indians uh, locally, and there was a a push to convert more American Indians because of this narrative. And I think there was a different, I, I would even say a different. Uh, dynamic of colonization back at the time, because I understand some of the driving force behind that was to acquire land. Joseph Smith's main motivation behind that was to acquire land, to get in, infiltrate these tribes and, and be able to get some land in that. <laughs> um, so greed and capitalism and some of these notions around that, I, it's, it's interesting to kind of look at that. I think the very central purpose, and I think a lot of times current Mormonism has divorced itself from this. And I, I got, I'm glad you bring up cognitive dissidents because I think the current narrative of Mormonism, and I know Cam talked a little bit about that, the changing of the narrative around um, the way we look at American Indians. But I, I think right now we we don't look at the some of the very central premises and principles of the, of the Book of Mormon is the explanation of American Indians and, and their need to become light and delightsome. Uh, that might be one of the very one of the foundational tenets of it. You know that Jesus came here to America. He converted Indians. Indians knew about Jesus, but they forgot and they became loathsome. And 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 it's the white guy's responsibility, Joseph Smith's responsibility to to bring this back. A, as a result, you see this work, this this piece of and I I, 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 I so there's no conf confusion. This this piece of um, 1830 fiction. Uh, that, that, that was however it was acquired, maybe it was plagiarized or however it was uh, acquired and made as one of the, as probably the most for myself, the most racist book that I, I have ever read. I've yet to read Mein Kampf, um, but the, the Book of Mormon does stand as the, as the most racist book, uh, affirmatively say that that's the, the most racist book that I that What I've parts read. about the Book of Mormon bother you most, Sheldon? Um, well, you could look at uh, Second Nephi chapter five, the whole the whole chapter there, you know, and we we look at these ideas around race and around color, uh, skin color. Um, I know Hiram talked a little bit about that earlier, about um, some of the edits that have happened and some of the reiterations behind it. Um, uh, pure and delightsome versus white and delightsome, uh, but just those central principles, and you can see that narrative that. The stories, how they've evolved to justify that, especially through the placement program. I understand there's a quote by Spencer W. Kimball at the time of the placement program or uh, something to the effect that he went to the, the to the Hogan of, uh, of Mary, who was placed with the Wright family up in Utah. And I go back to her home and, and you could see visibly that she is she is lighter than her siblings, you know, that the gospel has made her lighter um, than her siblings. And so you get these really direct notions that that white equals right, brown equals bad, you know? So you get the, these direct notions of that that are explicit in the Book of Mormon as well. Yeah. It, but we're okay now because King Lamont and I was converted, right? <laughs> There's no more cursing. That's, I, and I forget the nuance, but yeah. I, <laughs> well, I wouldn't say I, there's- I, just, I was told that, I was told that by uh, a leader. I wouldn't say there's no more cursing because the missionary I talked to earlier, I'm going to do it verbatim here. I pulled it up so I could read it. She said, yes, the skin, this was this year, missionary, a, an official uh, representative of the church. Yes, the skin color change was just a sign of a curse, not the curse itself. And so I asked, so skin was darkened due to a curse. And she responded, a curse was put upon the people. The curse that would, the curse was that they they were withdrawn from the spirit of God because they were wicked. 
And then she also says, it would appear this was done to limit wickedness. The skins of the Lamanites were dark, that thereby the Lord God might preserve his people, that they might not mix and believe incorrect traditions. That was this year, an official representative of the church. And you mm. can't really separate the skin color or skin issues from also being swept from the land. So, it, you know, you talked, Sheldon, you said something about um, it being a land issue also. And even in ether, it says those that whoso should possess the land should serve him, the true and only God, or they should be swept off. Um, and I have a quote here by Marion G. Bromney that says, having proved unworthy of protection by the might of the God of the land, the remnants of these people dwindled in unbelief until they reached the degradation in which Columbus found them. Um, and he's the one that quotes ether that we should be swept off of the land. So it's, it's all connected. And as much as we want to say that times have changed in regards to even just the skin color, they're not changing it church wide. They're very quiet about it. They're, they're changing a few things and not talking about it. I'd say they're not talking about it, but they're not correcting people. And so there's these young kids that have been born and raised being taught these things that go out to teach people, um, and she, I will say that this missionary wasn't aware um, of my indigenous identity <laughs> completely. So she didn't know, you know, that what she was saying to me was painful, but it's still, it's still something that's current. It's not, and that's, I think, why we, we work so hard to bring light to these subjects, because there's so many people still struggling with them silently. I think indigenous voices, there's they've been silenced for so long that we're just barely starting to talk about stuff. And I know Angela, you were talking about different indigenous people wanting to know what was their experience? How did they feel? Why aren't people talking out? Um, I think we're just beginning to see the beginning of people trying to, and it's extremely painful when your ancestry has been and your stories and your history have been taken and changed and narrated for you without permission. You know, I, I believed it 100%. I was very dedicated <laughs> in, in my belief and in my, the way I was Mormon. Um, and so I think it's very painful coming out. And I think we'll see more people, especially as there's more voices to turn to that people can identify with. I think one of the tougher things as well that was in the Book of Mormon, rather than just the uh, skin color coming out, was also uh, one of the parts that said, the curse shall be with the seed of, of those that, you, that mix us with their seed. So when I was, of course, in Utah uh, with my darker skin, you know, dating, whether in high school or, or college, it was tough because the parents would look at me, oh, he's got that curse. I mean, if you're going to you're going to marry that person he, he your kids will be have that curse as well whether it's blessings or curse i mean it was still looked upon and i would parents would look at me you know a little bit cross-eyed and, and some wouldn't accept me as, as quickly as others so it, it was prevalent in utah uh, very much so maybe not so much outside of utah but it what i lived it a lot daily that would have been, been yeah i really i want to again, commend them with their courage and bravery coming forward with this because, you know, it felt like 10 years ago when I did the film, I was just talking to myself. <laughs> I didn't think anybody was listening or that anybody would want to talk. And the truth was that they really didn't. The ones that I got to talk were the ones who didn't actually know that much. They were just really saying things that were informed about their opinion and their own experience. And, you know, I think the more that we're, we're starting to become aware and conscious of our positionality and the church's narratives and what they're doing in terms of, um, you know, treating indigenous peoples um, informed by their, their, their own belief systems that leaks into policy making and then law, um, we, we're questioning and we're pushing back more and more. And I'm glad to see that's happening now here too on the ground in San Juan County in Utah, where we've had people actually become more diligent about um, having that representation in all the areas of their lives, including political leaders. For so long, it's just been really dominated um, by 
really conser conservative, heavy, rep Republican, um, Mormon, non-Indigenous people. And, you know, that's uh, been sadly the case for pretty much all my life uh, up until now. So I think this is really an interesting time that we're living in. And I just want to encourage and thank all the, the folks here who are contributing to this conversation and being outward with it and being open and honest and having these talks because they help. They help a lot of people. I remember when I was doing the film, I would get random emails from Native Mormons asking me to help them. And I felt bad because I don't know what I can do for you. I can't help you. I don't know what I can do to help you get your baby back from, you know, the Mormon social services. I, we've lost them to the cracks. I don't know how to help you like figure out who your family is or what clan you belong to. Or it's like, I'm just a young student. I don't know much of that. I'm, I'm finding out and learning it myself. So the more that we actually go and talk about these things and try to heal that trauma within ourselves and that historical trauma that the church has made it with us in general, I think the better that our lives are going to be. So this is one of the very few things and, and you know, uh, commending, commending you as well, John, for doing that because not everybody would take the time to, to do that and support us in this way. And a lot of Mormon folks have your ear, you know, they, they, they listen to you and they, uh, they want to learn more. And I think this is, this is the new direction. If the church wants to grow and expand and know about who their members are, um, they're going to have to look inward and go all the way back to the beginning, even before that, to figure out who they are as Mormons. So thank you for this opportunity. I think it's great. And everybody's been sharing amazing stories. It's a real yeah, honor. Likewise. Thanks to all of you. I'd love to put a little plug in for Angelo real quick, if I could. Sure. Um, when I first came out, I, I was searching high and low for Lamanite stories. And it you do help people, Angelo, because I ran across your video. And it, it changed everything for me. When I talk about heritage and struggling with my heritage, it's not that everything that happened that bothered me. It's that I believed my ancestors caused their own demise, that it was their fault that they caused, that they caused genocide. And I grew up in, I've lived in 19 states now. I grew up as a kid, I was living in Virginia, West Virginia, Pennsylvania. And so the history there, um, I was very in tune with and the stuff I'd learn at school, um, the historical sites, I, I grew up being faced with it very early. Um, and so having, a, having that, that shame beyond my ancestors, it had a massive impact um, as far as heritage. And so when I saw your video, it was more than a voice. It was seeing your face. Films, man, films are amazing because I saw your face. I saw the face of other people you were talking to. And it connected me to an indigenous community when I needed an anchor. So... Thanks for that. And uh, I, I know in my interview, I talked about in layman's terms, um, your video. So I, with Angelo's permission, just added it to the laymanitetruth.com uh, resource page for anybody that wants to watch it. He's the, it's the, at the very top of the page for anybody watching that wants to see Angelo's video. So. So that's available publicly. Oh, uh, where can, will you tell us, Angela, where someone can watch your movie? That's uh, what I would. Yeah. So Sarah was just saying she put it on her site. Right. Um, I'm on there now, Sarah, laymanitruth.com. Resources. Under resources. And it's the top one. All right. I'm going to go ahead and paste both these links into uh, the Facebook feed so that those who are there um, can can access it. So uh, thank you, Sarah. And yes, thank you, Angelo. I uh, can't wait to watch that um, and share it with my kids. Um, okay, so um, let's go ahead and just acknowledge that the bad that happened with, uh, you know, 
of uh, you know early early America, early Mormonism is not just the genocide and the displacement and the slavery of natives. It's not just the racist language in the Book of Mormon. It's just this entire narrative that uh, that that the, that the natives, the Native Americans were um, were savages. It's it's erasing the level of sophistication, cultural sophistication uh, that they had achieved, and then it was sort of wh white people simultaneously enslaving and and murdering and and displacing and harming them and, and taking their land, but also assuming a position of superiority, and and that's sort of some of the most insidious parts of the Book of Mormon. It's just this idea that that we the Western the white, you know, Western Europeans are supposed to come in and preach to the Lamanites because they need our wisdom. They need our Christianity. They need to be reclaimed. They need to be restored um, because that whole narrative just completely erases and fails to acknowledge their level of wisdom and, and culture and sophistication that they had achieved. Um, and, and all of that, uh, is a huge disservice. And what I'd like to do uh, as the last part of this interview is to go through some of the elements uh, in your essay, Angelo, and talk, give each of you a chance to address um, sort of the modern damage or the modern tools that are being used from sort of a, a colonial, kind of a colonial perspective, um, and have you talk about how these things have affected each of you in your lives. And so the first element we have on our list is, is that, that, that Mormons, that these Western Europeans have assumed the power to name and claim, uh, you know, Native Americans from a dominant societal position. Who wants to talk about what, what that is trying to talk about and how it has um, played a negative role in your, your each, each of your stories? So the power to name and claim from a dominant societal position. Who wants to take that on first? I'll go. Please. I have an answer. Please. So, you know, the, the, the power comes from the power and authority of God. It's, it's through the priesthood leadership that uh, gives them a right to say, hey, you know, you are a chosen people. You will blossom as a rose. Uh, you are a Lamanite. Um, you were a descendant of, of Father Lehi. Um, and, and with that, with that, uh, with that teaching, with that belief coming from our leaders, you know, we have no choice but to kind of bow down to that, uh, uh, you know, idea. Uh, otherwise, you know, we're apostates. Um, and so, you know, as members of the church, we have no reason to, or we have no, um, uh, we, have, we have no option there. We have no choice. And I think, you know, it's, and it's not their fault. It's not the, the priest, it's not today's bishop's fault. It's not today's prophet's fault. I mean, this stems all the way back to Joseph Smith. <laughs> um, and so, I, you know, that, that power is there to say, hey, you, this is who you are. This is where you come from. These are your people. And, uh, you know, as members of the church, what are we, what are we to do? Um, we're, we're just going to, we're just going to suffer in silence and just go, go with the flow. And Hiram, how has it hurt you to be named a, a Lamanite? Um, and to have your your history and your culture sort of erased and and to be provided sort of a fictional culture and heritage in its place. How has that harmed you, if you're willing to share? I mean, you know, just the, the terms of the Book of Mormon is a good place to start, but it's the whole idea of, you know, the the people there, Father Lehi and his family um, taking the, the boat trip to the Americas it, without there being any, you know, strong evidence DNA wise that, that these people actually came, um, and settled here. Uh, you know, it, for, for me, you know, the more I grew older that you, as I went through my faith crisis, that was my belief that somehow, some way these people came here and settled. And, and that's, these are my people, these are my, my ancestors, but hey, I'm going to look in the mirror and I'm going to have people say, Hey, Hiram, you know, you, 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 you Asian, <laughs> are you Hispanic? Are you, you know, you, you look like uh, um, uh, um, a, a Filipino. I've gotten that many, many times. And I'm going to put my face up to, you know, a Tibetan man or a Mongolian man. Um, my grandfather's, uh, you know, family members, we, we're um, of those people. <laughs> uh, 
And I've had numerous uh, conversations with with past bishop, former bishops, who've tried to, you know, they want me to come back to the fold. And so, you know, we'll, we'll send, you know, he'll send Book of Mormon passages towards me, and I'll come back with, hey, well, well, look, wait a minute, these people out in uh, Tibet have, you know, they're living in hogans, you know, they're wearing jewelry, they're like us, they have turquoise, you know, they, they raise sheep and llamas, and they sell their jewelry and food on the side of the road, like, like, you can't deny this. So, but the church is not willing to acknowledge any of what I have to say, and, and so that, I mean, it's either, you, you know, I'm going to be, um, you know, kind of just put in the spot to where, I, you know, I don't have a say, I don't have a choice and just go with the flow or do I choose to be an authentic person, go with how I truly feel in my heart and, and distance myself from that belief and, and go with what, uh, what feels right and what the history tells me. So that, I mean, that's, that's how I perceive uh, the whole idea. Hey, John, I used, I, used my, I used to get my hair cut by a guy from Jerusalem. He's Jewish every day. And I looked at him it was about 10 years ago. And I would look at him and I would say, how does that guy look even close to what I look like? How is my family from Jerusalem if I don't even look close to the people that, are, that actually are from Jerusalem? Um, yet, when I look, um, when my mom would listen to the Athabascan or the Inuit people up in Alaska, she would listen to their, the way they spoke on TV, and she would go, oh, my goodness, I can understand them. And she said the Navajo language is so close to the Inuit and Athabascan people, so you can understand words. And I just didn't understand that. I'm like, well, that's so weird because the Inuit belief is, or their, their tradition is that they came across the land bridge. And so how is it that our, our language is so close to their language? And so that was one of the things. So the way it hurt me is that for 38 years, I believed I was Jewish. I believed, I, I thought, why, how did we lose the Passover, Passover tradition that's still, you know, here today in Jerusalem? Why didn't that, why didn't that get crossed over when, when Lehi came over? In fact, um, in my patriarchal blessing, it says I'm a direct descendant of Lehi. So my, my beliefs were that, oh my goodness, I am a direct descendant of Lehi. I am Jewish. I, have, I should be doing this Passover um, tradition. Um, and lastly, whenever, when I went to the, when I went to the temple, uh, I got my new name. It was Samuel, Samuel. And I was like, this has got to be true because, you know, Samuel was a Lamanite. I believe that that name was given to me only and only me that day because I was Lamanite, because I was uh, from Laman and from the Lehi uh, family. And so that's what hurt me was that belief that I, that I carried with me for 38 years, thinking that I came from a different land, a different place. When in truth, I came from Mongolia, Asia, those places, that's where my family came from, other than my father, of course, but that's truly where I came from. And so now when I finally learned that and I could look at myself in the mirror or look at some other Asians and know, oh, my goodness, that, that's where I came from. That's where my DNA comes from. That's where my, my look comes from. Thank you. Thank you. So, so John, uh, one more quick thing on that, too, is, um, you know, there are there are many ways that not just Mormons, but, you know, Americans, United States in general has really ripped the naming of indigenous peoples and places and replaced it with their own. And it never became more apparent to me than when I was there in New York City in the Northeast, uh, because even when they came to the country, they didn't have names. They didn't have any anything new. There was like New Jersey, New York, New Derry, New London, because those were the places of their old country. Uh, and, you know, they simultaneously take the names of the people and the places while removing them and displacing them. So in a lot of the places that have indigenous names, the native people aren't there anymore. And so that's really one of the interesting things about this country and about uh, the religions here too, is they, they simultaneously take our names and appropriate their powers. And it really makes them a little bit more empowered about how they try to take on what they believe to be is uh, our narrative by imposing their own. Um, so I just wanted to put that forward just because that still happens. Um, I think a good example of it too um, is if you look over there right in Salt Lake City up by where, um, you know, um, 
the ski resort is uh, by Snowbird up on there. And if you go all the way back on the top, there's a place called Devil's Castle. Nobody knows why it's called Devil's Castle other than it has like this amazing rock formation with this beautiful little lake area. And there's this huge tree there that's growing really well and healthy. But more than likely, it's a sacred place. And it was probably called Devil's because Native people went there to do their offerings and their prayers. So they conducted ceremony and they would have a place where they would meet and take care of this place. And so anything that wasn't religious, that wasn't Christian, that wasn't Mormon was seen as the devil's work. And all the heathens were coming there to gather to do their, their little um, ceremonies. So in a lot of these places, especially in Northeast, you have that same thing. Devils, you know, Devil, Devil's Canyon, uh, Devil's River, um, all these places that are named after where indigenous peoples would go. And so that's not just in the renaming, that's also directly inferred in the intention of having uh, these indigenous people seen as the opposite of them, which were wicked and heathen. So I wanted to bring attention to that because people, they often forget that um, it's not just about what a place is called, it's why it's called that. Um, so I wanted to kind of just add that on top to what they're saying, because, you know, think about the places that you're in. These are all indigenous places. So why is that thing named that? So that's what I wanted to um, impart with you guys is think about some of the places that we go to all the time and why they're called what they're called. Thank you. Anybody else uh, want to share the power, um, the you know the the negative power of an institution like the church being able to name you and claim your heritage in ways that doesn't reflect reality and how that's played out in your lives? I have one thing I could add, um, which is more how it affects me since leaving the church is. I'm the only one of my family that's left and not being able to have a, a open relationship, you know, I, and this is, this is a lot my grandma's fault probably because she taught family first so much. Um, I've, I've talked, I've reconnected with a lot of family this year. And I've had, I've had uncles that have never called me, call me. Um, my uncle Victor called and said, you are always my family. And um, I remember starting to cry when he said that, you know, somewhere in our conversation. Um, my uncle Bert said, religion doesn't matter. Family is family, no matter what. And what, what some of the stuff that they taught me, which I grew up learning from my grandmother also is nothing Nothing keeps family apart, you know, always, always love each other, regardless of, of each other's choices. And so you'll find a lot of indigenous people that come out of at least Mormonism. And at least just in my experience, I don't know, I don't know about other people, but I assume I'm, I can't be alone in this, in that we have a great deal of respect for our elders, regardless of if they're still Mormon, if they're whatever religion they choose. And so we need to be sensitive at least I feel the need to be sensitive to my family. And so I don't have in-depth conversations about identity, but it, it has caused a disconnect kind of between, between me and, you know, my parents, my own mother, she's full believing Lamanite, um, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of pain. I know a lot of people that leave religion have that same type of thing that happens. Um, but it, it, there's like this extra, I don't know how to describe it really. Maybe somebody can help me out with this, but where there's this extra just frustration over loss of culture. And I cannot turn to my direct elders that I have always leaned on all of my life for direction to reconnect with a culture that they're no longer a part of. And I still need to show them respect and honor them and, and uh, allow them to have their, you know, be a Mormon path or whatever path they have. So there's like this disconnect in leadership. And luckily for me, I have uncles to turn to and, 
an aunt that um, my aunt Marie helped me through. She's my, she's Navajo. And she, she taught me a bunch of similar things, brought me to tears um, this last year of just encouraging me to just love family as family, regardless of religion. So I'm getting this support from them, but I, I often think about how many people out there don't have that connection or support because everybody's, you know, I think about people in Polynesia, the Polynesian, the, the center, and, you know, there's so many generations of people that, that have been told a certain heritage and had their culture taken. And it's really hard when you don't have somewhere to connect, you know, your direct elders or your direct family that you also want to respect. I don't know. Does that make sense? Does anybody else experience that? Or is it just me? <laughs> but yeah, so I, I would say that's an, that's something that's affected me with the Lamanite narrative since leaving. That's different. You know, I've, I've expressed what affected me while I was in, but it's, it's hard having that disconnect from a generation that, that I need that guidance from and can't have it that I need a certain relationship with, but it's changed. I'll add on to that. And that's, thanks for sharing that, Sarah. That's, I know, very painful, actually, to look at that. But I know there's this idea about positional superiority. And I think going back to that original uh, call of the question, you know, is the naming and, and claiming aspect of Mormonism and how that's, um, the, the American Indian erasure, that's been, been connected to that, like, I think there has been people that have forgotten about that. And this is not necessarily directly Mormonism, but colonization in general. For, for Cheyennes, when we were placed on a reservation in 1884, that's when uh, the Northern Cheyenne Reservation was established. There's a prohibition for us to actually go to our sacred mountain, our temple, you know, Bear Butte, Nora Wuss in Cheyenne. You know, there was a prohibition against our, our sun dance. We couldn't practice it for 30 years. And so the loss that happens in the disruption in our leadership and our ceremonial ways and it, which is interesting now, a quick quick departure from, from that idea right now, but it's interesting if you look at Cheyenne ceremony and I juxtaposition that against Mormon ceremony, where I've been at both actually, and so maybe I, I, I could even do this with my, through my own eyes, you know, being able to do that. I think that capturing of the metaphor, um, where I don't think necessarily Western religion necessarily offers that as much, where there is the literal, you know, like Mormonism is supposed to be true, to, with a capital T, scientifically, anthropologically, archaeologically, it's supposed to be true, you know, where, where I think ceremony, Cheyenne ceremony, it's intentionally to be symbolic and metaphorical for you to, for you to interpret into your own life. Um, last, another point connected to that is that all of us, all peoples, you know, people that are listening to this, this podcast now, you know, they were indigenous at one time, they were people of the earth that were colonized by Christianity. John, you, your people wore beads and feathers, you know, you were, you were indigenous, you know, and, and the ceremonies that reaffirmed your connection to the earth and that reciprocity that you had with the earth, um, what, we developed those narratives and the ceremonies because it was part of our survival, you know, and, and that's very live and well in Cheyenne life in 2018, where I don't think, I think sometimes Mormonism and Western religion in general lives in this very, um, isolated or insulated rather um, world where, where they don't have connection to the earth on a, on a daily basis. You know, they don't know where their food comes from directly. They don't know where their water comes from directly, where indigenous religion and ceremony provides that. And that's something that was taken away from us. They, they directly, that's what the impact is, is our, our leadership was disrupted. Our, our knowledge ways was, were disrupted. Uh, what Sarah was talking about, the way we position knowledge is that, oh, this is Mormon knowledge. It, it, it gets the place at the table as opposed to traditional ways. You know, but I, I'm not going to tell you those ways or, or those ways have been taboo where you look at language loss in indigenous communities, you know, like once again, my, for my story, my father, first language, Cheyenne, didn't learn English until he's five, six. Um, my Cheyenne, not very much, um, if any, you know. So there's been just a, and, and largely because of taboo around, about how he spoke English, frankly, you know, of, of how he spoke English. He didn't want us to, to be able to have to suffer through learning English in those ways. I, I've heard him. I've heard that version of it. But there's probably a lot of other things that he, he's never told us. There's a whole period of boarding schools, you know, where 
we were forced and had our hair cut, you know, like we, and you could imagine this. And I know I, I heard you talk about your, your daughters, John, or your children, you know, like, and, and people that also have children. You look at the placement program and you look at these boarding school efforts of assimilating youth. Uh, I have two sons, you know, it would be devastating to me if somebody came and took my kids away and said, you know what, you're not cutting it as a father. Your kids are going to have a better chance living with these people. Um, and for my kids to affirm that, you know, for them to ch choose to divorce themselves from my culture or my identity, maybe change their last name from Spotted Elk to whatever, you know, that would that would be really devastating uh, psychologically to me and, and, and harmful to me and my my community, you know, and that that was alive and well, actually. Uh, when they did the survey, uh, they passed the Indian Child Welfare Act at 40 years old, actually 1874, eight. They did all this research up to it. Um, where there was a Mormon Indian placement program exemption from that federal act that happened back then. But when they did those, they called all these uh, tribal communities to get numbers. There was a tribal community in Utah that had 100% of their children, 100, 100%, a community with no children that were placed off reservation for the school program, you know? So that was just, you, you could imagine the devastation that, that would take and, 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 this, and the things were still, uh, still have the, a, light, a trauma from it, you know, the, the PTSD and, and also the, not only post-traumatic stress disorder, but also post-colonial stress disorder that we, we all endure, you know, so um, that, those are some real and alive things that are happening in 2018 with, within the American Indian community. Thank you, Sheldon. Um, <clears throat> Angelo, in your, in your essay on Porter Rockwell and Samuel the Lamanite, uh, you, you talk about how Porter Rockwell, uh, you, you tell a story about Brigham Young and Porter Rockwell relating to his long hair, and then you contrast that uh, with, with uh, BYU's policies around grooming for all its students, but included Native Americans. Do you mind talking about the contrast between those two things? Yeah, sure. Um... I just really wanted to put the juxtaposition about why the church would want um, natives to have long, short cut hair um, as is required for the dress code normally in those environments. Um, but just making the connection between also looking at Porter Rockwell historically had long hair. And he was, you know, very much a religious fanatic who was kind of a homicidal, homicidal maniac on the arm of the church um, and was endorsed by Brigham Young and utilized quite a bit as really his, uh, his right hand in terms of muscling people out. Um, and I think that I really want to remind Mormons of that history. It's like, these are people that you endorsed, cultivated you know, grew as folks were coming over into this space and are still getting established. They're still making relationships with our communities to not let them forget that they're still newcomers here and that we know these lands very well. And we remember things that happened to us like this, whether it was Porter Rockwell killing, you know, indigenous family members on various tribes within the Utah mountain range or even the Posey Wars that have happened here in San Juan County in the 1920s, which wasn't that long ago. Had an entire posse coming after him, even though it was just one man. So I think there's so much that's not been addressed historically in this region with, in regards to Utah and the Mormon influence of violence um, that nobody really addresses these things openly and they should because things like the Bear River Massacre, Mountain Meadows Massacre, the Black Hawk Wars, the Posey Wars, these are all very influential into the present day and they leak into policy and lawmaking. And I think those things have relevancy to our lives even today. They didn't just happen a long time ago. For us, it was just like, you know, yesterday, it was like last week, because we see things again comprehensively in a very long timeline. And to us, it's like these... Mormon white folks just got here. <laughs> like, who, who are they to tell us what to do, what to think, what to believe, and how to be, especially when it comes to our traditions and our hair. And we have like these sacred teachings around our hair, keeping them long, having it in these certain ways that we 
put them up and that we have them in ceremony. We have them with prayers. And for us, asking us to do something disrespectful to ourselves or to our culture is uh, it's offensive and insulting. And, you know, I just wanted to keep bringing that point up because you can think about those things emotionally, but I wanted to make it not just a spiritual point, but an intellectual one. Want them to think about it, whoever's reading it, to think about why are they asking you to do this thing when if you thought about it more, it wouldn't make sense. So while Joseph Smith basically tells Porter Rockwell, according to legend, cut not thy hair and no bullet or blade can harm thee, while he was running around killing, as you report in this book, hundreds of people, um, um, Native Americans who are who are taught that their uh, hair length is is sacred, uh, whether they're in boarding schools, you know, the Indian Placement Program or BYU, are forced to cut their hair, um, you know, without any real regard for their sacred cultural uh, beliefs and traditions. Is that kind of what you're saying? It is. And, you know, when BYU um, not too long ago decided again, they still wanted to have that policy. I was disappointed <laughs> because it's like, if you really want to include Native folks into your church, then you should let them be Native folks. Don't try to, like, condition and assimilate them into being your cookie cutter homogenized version of yourself. That's That has never worked historically, and it won't work. And so I think if people are really respecting that kind of diversity, they wouldn't ask that of us. Makes sense. Sarah. Has, has anybody uh, seen the article that ABC four did there um, on the BYU student that had to petition to be allowed to keep his long hair? Anybody read that? It was, uh, his name's Michael Raphael Williamson Tabango, and he's of the Quechua nation and the Atavalo tribe. Um, which both originated in Ecuador. And he he's a believer. So you've got somebody that loves the church, is going to BYU, but also wants to respect his culture. And so Tabango thought that the process of petitioning the code would be as simple as verifying his identity as a tribe member, but it wasn't. He says the petition since March, when he admitted to the university, um, was denied. But he, he also talks about, like, he explains their hair symbolizes a root system that connects them to their culture and to each other. Tabango said, I'm LDS, so it's BYU has always been one of my top choices. At the end of the day, I wanna study in a place that respects my religious and my cultural values. Um, so there was somebody this year, this was uh, reported in August of this year by ABC4. So it's something that's still happening, it's current that that misunderstanding, I think if, if the church could understand that there's faithful people that also want to honor their culture, they'd see a massive shift if they were able to just honor those people and, and embrace them for who they are and embrace those cultures rather than the colonized, you know, mindset that we've had to live with. You know, I, I think it, it can grow and it can change. And I think for those people that do want to stay in the church that are indigenous, that there should be they should be embraced and respected and, and loved for all parts of them. I, I think for, it's interesting. I, I reflect as Sarah's talking, I reflect back to, so I, I went on a mission, like I was saying earlier, I went on a mission and I remember going to the MTC um, and as context, I, I feel like my dad, like I mentioned my father, you know, we, I learned about sweet medicine at our dinner table. Um, so I, I did hold these two beliefs, you know, that What's were medicine. What is that? Um, he's our cultural hero. He's our, the Cheyenne Jesus Christ, if you will. He, he's the one that taught us our way of life. Um, that's current government structure, ceremonial structure, that the Cheyenne way of life was taught to us by, by sweet medicine, sweet root standing direct translation from Cheyenne. Um, so he was, he was the one that, that gave us uh, our, our religion, if you will. Um, and so uh, but I grew up with those two things. Um, and I remember in Cheyenne identity was definitely a part of who I am. My last name is Spotted Elk. I wore that on my name tag, you know, you know? so I remember one uh, having a conversation with a, with another missionary in the MTC uh, making me choose like it, it, those two things couldn't coexist, you know, to be Cheyenne and be Mormon. I had to be a Mormon 
and, and, and not a Cheyenne. I had to give up being a Cheyenne actually. And so like, like you have to divorce yourself. You have to give all that up, you know, cut your hair, lose your identity and, and become a Mormon. And so those two things couldn't coexist. And so I, it's, it's interesting that, that this guy is petitioning BYU to, to try to make him exist. It's really hard for me. And I know that word decolonization, man, for me, it's almost lost its savior. It's used so much, so much these days. Um, but, I, but I look at, like with Mormonism, it's hard for me to put those two things together because I see Mormonism and religion in general, you know, legally, and I'm going to shoot from the hip here, uh, and I can provide some some argument to this as well legally. Um, but but the two drivers around the dispossession of American Indian land, are, we're looking at gold, we're looking at natural resources, and we're looking at God. Um, those two the, two, the two G's, you know, and so um, I, I think that at the very core is one of the tools of colonization and, and to try to salvage it in some ways of root it all out. I don't know if there'd be anything left necessarily if we say, oh, if we just, if Mormonism would just change this, then, then it would decolonize it. It'd be more tolerant. You know, it'd be, it'd be great for Indians, you know, like it'd be great. But, but I don't think the the premise, the central premises of what Mormonism is built upon, it, it's at its very core of, of to be a colonizer. You know, it's one of the three great American religions, you know, Jehovah Witness, um, Seventh-day Adventist and Mormonism, and I think Mormonism very specifically is trying to describe that angst around how did these Indians get here, you know, like what are these Indians here and and, and what is our rightful place in, in in the United States? And there's narratives around it, like you mentioned, John, earlier about that that solves the cognitive dissonance if you start thinking too hard about all this stuff, you know, <laughs> like there's these stories that, that can make us forget about them, you know, so um, that fascinating stuff. Yeah, yeah, Sheldon, uh, thank you for bringing that up. I, that, I wholeheartedly agree with you 100% on what you just said. Um, you know, a, a quick point that I wanted to bring up too was, um, yeah, it's interesting. People people are making both work. They're, they're at the church on Sunday, and then they have their their native uh, side that they practice in. Um, so th- 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 I just wanted to bring something up quick. So, so in, the na- in the native tradition, most native traditions, especially the Navajo uh, way, we, we have certain ceremonies that, um, you know, we'll, we'll bring out the pipe okay? and then we'll smoke tobacco, whether it be, you know, um, a, a ceremony in Hogan or, or sweat lodge, you know, we'll, we'll smoke. And, and of course, you know, we know, we as many people know what that's for, what that's like. It, it's, it's a peace. It's a sense of, you know, getting, uh, forming a sense of fellowship for us. Um, there's a lot of different meanings behind that, but the tobacco smoke traditionally has no stimulants. It's it's all it's, it's it's a natural herb. You know, it comes from the mountain. Okay, so so you you get a Navajo Mormon <laughs> who's going to attend the ceremony and he's gonna smoke. But then you know what about the word of wisdom theory with the Mormon Church? I mean, say he say he goes in for a, a temple recommend interview. He's gonna be asked about the word of wisdom. What does he say to that? So going back to what Sheldon's saying, you, you really just can't do both. It's, it's almost impossible. And that's just one example out of probably 100 different things. Um, so that's, that's the way I look at it. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I, I still, I still uh, talk to uh, my leaders of the church um, in my word of my stake. And I, I just got a phone call uh, from the secretary of, of, of my stake in Arizona. And uh, the stake president wants to visit with me. Uh, sometime this week. So I'm going to take that out as an opportunity um, not to necessarily take counsel from him. But I take these opportunities. The reason why I still meet with these guys is because it's an opportunity for me to to teach a little bit. Not to sound arrogant, but it gives me an opportunity to present what we're here right now talking about. I mean, we talk about change and we can talk, we can talk and discuss all the things right here as much as we want. But until the leaders of the church hear what we have to say, you know, again, again, this is my opportunity to go into the stake center, to go into the stake president's office and say, hey, look, you know, thank you for what you've done for me as, as a Mormon church. It's benefited in me some ways. But but listen, this is a real issue. And, and, and uh, this is what I have to tell you. And so I'm going to hold up a, a picture real quick of a of um. A Na- uh, Navajo uh, blessing. Uh, I hope this is appropriate, but I'm, I'm doing it more just to make a point. <laughs> so, Please. I hope you guys can see that real quick. Yeah. Keep keep showing it. 
been a whole gone. The, the medicine man doing a blessing on a patient there. You can see the, the sand painting on the floor. So as I've gone into different interviews with these leaders, I'll show this particular photograph to them. And my question is, does that look familiar? <laughs> and they, they're dumbfounded. They're shocked. They're, the first question is, well, where'd you get that picture? Like, what is this of? Um, and I'll explain to them what it is. But then I'll also come back and say, well, look, that certainly looks like a priesthood blessing, doesn't it? However you view this blessing here, this is, a, this is a type of blessing that has been going on before 1000 uh, BC. This has been around for a long time, and it's going to continue to be around for a long time, long before Joseph Smith. And so <laughs> I'm hoping I'll have the opportunity to, to share this photograph as, as well as many other different things that we've discussed with the state president this week. So I, mean, I just wanted to kind of point that out, and um, you know, we've got to get the word out there. <laughs> I love that. Thank you. It's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful uh, photo. Uh, 